Uh, namaste and welcome to A Questioning Mind. I'm your host, Sagarika, and it is my absolute honor today to have with me Mr. Vikram Sooth, uh, Spy Master Par Excellence and author of The Ultimate Goal, one of the best books I've read on narrative setting. Uh, and uh, this cuts across borders. I definitely urge all of you to get the book uh, because this is not written in a manner that focuses upon only uh, India, it focuses on India in the wider context of the world and how narratives have been set across ages and across uh, borders. So thank you so much for joining me today, Mr. Sooth. Uh, it's an absolute Thank you very much. Um, of course. Uh, so, all right, we'll begin with uh, the book because it's not every day that an Indian spy master offers an absolute masterpiece. So, uh, <laughs> What prompted you to actually write about this, uh, about narratives in general? It's not a John Le Carre style espionage, uh, book on no, espionage. No. Okay. Actually, actually, building narratives is a part of spycraft. And uh, when I was working, one could see how major powers would let out stories in the media or anywhere else. And then you found that things were actually happening that way. So that that made me think a lot, and you know, we sort of got an idea that this is how stories are. This is how uh, an impression is created. I am the best guy on earth. I I I am noble. I I, I am trustworthy. Mm -hmm. I have all the freedoms. And you keep saying that again and again and again. I mean, Goebbels was right. You keep this, saying the same story, people start to believe it or accept it. Now then, um, actually, I wrote a... The, the, uh, at some stage, I realized that, you know, this is how the game is played. And we are, in, we are a small country relatively compared in, in terms of influence and power in the 70s and 80s and 90s that uh, we will have to be dependent on on stories that come out about us mostly because we don't have our own story to tell and then i wrote my first book which was the unending game which was entirely about espionage not raw but espionage in general and there i had a chapter called controlling the narrative uh, because I, I i wanted to make the point that narratives don't just happen they have to be created also. And there has to be a consistent, uh, long-term view of things to get them done. It can't be that I stand up today and make, uh, wave my flag and say, I'm the greatest and everybody will buy the story. And there's no point in your being rich and powerful without the world knowing. That's how the game is played. They have to know who's the, who's who's the big dad on the on the street, yes. So, yes. and and when you're a smaller in the in terms of influence, smaller country it doesn't make that much of a difference. But when you are aspiring to a certain state stature on the globe, and you can see it happen, that's the time that you must sit down and say, ask yourself, so what is my story? Mm -hmm. Where do I come from? What was I? And what shall I be? So right. how do I get there? So then how did the others do it? That's oh. why I wrote that book, how the others did it. How Bollywood, Hollywood was such an integral part of the whole scheme. Hmm. I mean, uh, I in my youth, I started smoking cigarettes because I want to be like the Marlboro man. You know, that's that's influence. That is creating an imagery about yourself. Right. You've not pulled any punches when it comes to, you know, the West, uh, the JFK murders, uh, the J uh, Kennedy murders, actually, about JFK and his brother. <laughs> but uh, you've actually gone through a lot of the propaganda machinery without referring to Goebbels a lot, which is impressive because it's always Goebbelsian and uh, propaganda yeah. is a dirty word. And however, yeah. it's most powerful and the Western countries that have employed it. Yes. Yeah, it is, so, it is. 
you do the propaganda i merely do the narrative <laughs> that's the difference you know when now why is russia today banned by the west mm. if they are not if they have the story right then why aren't they letting russia why are the boy the blanking out russia today why are the bank banking uh, blanking out tiktok mm. because then that is not that is if we were to do it they say you are fascist you are uh, you shutting down your freedom of speech yeah. and you there is much more freedom of speech in india than there is anywhere else there is so much freedom that it is at times frightening mm. absolutely you can up and say whatever you like to mm. whoever you like about whatever you like and absolutely that, so this this term being fascist or being uh, yeah, demo, democracy is at an end where where is it an end just the, because the party in power is not the one you wanted so it's an yeah. end yeah that's now it works well, the election is stolen when you know somebody feels like it but it's uh, legitimate when it's the right party in power so yeah. that is that it's always the the democracy means my guy must win yes <laughs> so the person i like must win exactly. that's that's not how it works actually and and um, with us it has always been uh, a desire to look good in the west hmm hmm you know uh, we always sort of at the back of our mind psychologically we used to feel or oh, maybe they won't like it they are very powerful they be should no no it's not good to 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 behave like this i will we have to learn that i have to behave in my national interest absolutely not anybody else's and there is no harm in my being uh, frank about it and saying so that it is not in my national interest to frank sanction Russia, the way you want to do it, I won't do it. Mm. It's not my war. I didn't start it. I hate wars as much as anybody else, but this is not my war. So I'm not going to uh, join you in your uh, campaign. Um, do you see it changing for us? Changes for us? Do you see that the narrative is changing a little bit for us due to ongoing? I think I think, it, I think it is. I think it is, but I think we are still making that same mistake as we used to do in the past. That whenever somebody says something to about us, we get into a flutter and we start yelling and criticizing. That that's not the way. The way actually to do it is to dig out stories about them and have them published. Absolutely, absolutely. You write a nasty one. I'll write a nasty one. Absolutely. And in these days of um, internet and WhatsApp. All these social media, I can float that story in ten minutes all over the world. Yes. Yeah. So we have to learn to counter or anticipate and write a story about how uh, how the president of the United States or the State Department or anybody else yeah. is 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 playing a dual game or or playing yeah. a dubious game or whatever you think is you think is happening. So uh, now you bring out very fancy um, reports on the Indian political scene, all these graphs and dots and maps to show that you've done a lot of research. But who have you researched? Yeah. You know, the Indian uh, mind is not, it's, it's so diverse and diffuse. Sure. You cannot have a stereotype. And all these pro projections that they do, advance of the elections, are meant for a certain audience. Mm -hmm. So we have to we have to learn to accept and counter them. We don't have to just cry at them. Right now, we are very reactive. I think now when it comes yeah. to narratives that other people set, and it's yeah. so easy to go out there, and we don't have to lie. The thing no, is, for not them, at they all. 
lie about us, but we don't yeah. have to lie considering their history and uh, not even heritage, but it's ongoing uh, uh, events. Uh, for example, in New York City, there are people cooking rats, right? The homeless, the fentanyl uh, problem. It's so large in San Francisco. There are people shooting out um, homeless people on the streets, and yet these are not mainstreamed in India. India retains an image derived from Hollywood, yeah. so of, of the West. So yes, yeah. so we have to we have to tell the story to them yeah. about them, and yeah. let's see how they react. Let's see how they react. Absolutely. Do we have a mechanism in place that is powerful enough, like a media industry that is powerful enough to do that? Because uh, for example, Qatar, a small country, tyrannical in its uh, regime that's tyrannical and absolutely against anything called human rights, has a lot more influence through Al Jazeera and their outlets. They employ people who speak the language of the West to tell the stories that they yeah. want told. So that's when, do, how do we build that machine? That, that is very certain about, you know, um, that just tells their story the way uh, it is perceived outside of the West. Yeah, you know, to to be able to sell a story, you must be first telling a story that the other person is willing to accept. Right. You know, if if you come and tell me I'm fat and ugly, I'm not going to talk to you again. But if you say nice things to me, I, I would certainly want to be able to talk to you again. So our stories have to be built on a very human level, be acceptable to the, the other side. And then, then you introduce what you want them to hear. First you introduce what they want to hear, but well, now you want to introduce what you want them to hear. Mm -hmm. That is the difference of how narratives get acceptable. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so uh, I've noticed that even outside of English media journalism, which has always been, and it's it's not just we notice it now more because of the volume of information we're con uh, consuming. However, they have always been anti India and anti Hindu, particularly, right? Uh, in um, most of the Anglo Felic media. When it comes to countries that are of strategic importance, like France, uh, whether it's any European language media, it is also similarly um, um, negative. It's, it's extremely negative. It's been negative throughout, regardless of government changes. And mm. we typically miss those because we don't speak the language. Uh, but, um, you know, if you, if you delve into it, you can always see that it's negative. So, um, do you think that citizens con consuming this, having these ideas reinforced about a poor country that's becoming an upstart on the world stage and taking contrarian decisions, do you think that the citizen, um, the citizens' feelings will get reflected at a strategic level at some point? I think it will come because right now the feeling is that that the the the, the kind of hold the West had on the rest of the world, particularly as they assumed after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that has begun to change. We take pride in our being being nationalist, yeah. but that's not a good term for the globalist. Right. Right. It's quite contrary to that. Now, right. if there is going to be another country which is going to be a major economy in the next 10, 15 years, you will make three countries of that category. China, Japan and us. Yeah, Asia and all of them. So, you can't say, tell Indians, you can't progress. The ideal thing would be if they had a government here, which is more pliable. Right. That's what, that's, that would be their national interest. Hmm. And they would then, they try to hit at you in other ways. The Hindu card, the, the, the you know, um, they've never ever said about these grooming gangs in Britain and less in, in Manchester and uh, Birmingham or, where, or Rochdale or wherever, Rotherham, that who the, what was the identity of these people? 
Mm. Because then that's a it's a matter of votes. It's a matter of vote banks. They yeah. also have their vote bank politics. They talk, tell us, but they have theirs. They all don't want to name it. And it becomes politically correct to say oh. Asian. Asian, South Asian, South Asian. Yes. So that, that, that also works for them. Mm. I, I'm going to borrow the same idea. Yes. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because exactly uh, the last video before this, I had a British Muslim academician who studied the incidents in Rotherham and all of the violence in Leicester and even Smithwick and uh, these places. And he was discussing how the Hindu through boogeyman was simply, it's just a boogeyman. It's not there. It was never there. Mm -hmm. And yet so many news outlets, especially the Guardian and uh, labor uh, related um, outlets never covered it and of course there was some amount of political complicity <clears throat> excuse me however uh, when it comes to uh, even in India within India when um, I've noticed articles where they say two people have died they will frame it in the complete context of Hindu extremism uh, yeah. what they call Hindu extremism which is no different from Hindu extremism which has never caused a terrorist incident in the whole world ever and yet uh, they frame it in that context and the two men have died they will never reveal the names of the men who happen to be Hindu who have, who yeah. have been killed by people of different communities so um, so this is this is very commonplace um, it's, it is causing a lot of reaction, but we still don't have the proactive approach because I'm not even sure we have journalists who are settled outside, that many journalists who are settled outside who can cover these stories and cover their realities and feed it to them with the human touch, as you mentioned. So uh, I guess with the military industrial complex in the West, um, does it require a similar complex here in the Indian subcontinent to be able to deliver such stories uh, you know, effectively. You know, inevitably, we will have to have the private sector, the corporate right. sector. They'll have to play the game because it is going to be in their interest also to have a measure of control on. They don't want a story coming out from the West saying that the business interests are appalling in India or there's something wrong with the corporate sector because that hurts them. So, and as our corporate sector become bigger, naturally the interests will become bigger. So we will have to co-opt them in, 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 a, in an informal way to sell the India story. We can't do it on our, the governments can't do it on their own. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty, um, can be very wooden about the whole thing. And, um, you know, you want you want points, you want results, you want to measure the results, and that those kind of don't work. And when you're doing narratives and stories like that, it's an impression that you're trying to create. So you have to have a, a, an involvement involvement of the corporate sector, and um, and 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 that's how they will finally be able to play the game. You have to strike. First, you have to tell your story now, not mm -hmm. tomorrow, mm -hmm. and uh, not be not be f scared of of an opinion. Of that said, they they have the advantage that as is that it works on an eco echo chamber basis. Mm -hmm. The negative story comes out there. Somebody picks it up here, embellishes it, goes back to them, and you know it goes round and round and. Uh, it has its own life, and now over a period of time, it becomes the accepted wisdom. Right. That's that's the counter we have to. That's the counter. That's how something has to be countered by by us. Um, one of the intelligence agencies across the world that has an immense um, control of the narrative space is the Mozart, the Israeli spy agency. Mm -hmm. and their, uh, the, the impression that the world has about them is made via Hollywood and uh, it's made by a continuous retelling of each of their more popular um, incidents and uh, events. So, for example, the revenge on uh, the blasts at the Munich Olympics. So, 
um, things like that have gotten into the mainstream understanding that they are an agency not to be messed with. Uh, funnily enough, their spends do not correlate to their efficiency, whereas a smaller agency like the RDW in India has achieved a lot more in perhaps a minuscule fraction of the same spends. This is not to put anyone down, it, it, it's just that mm -hmm. uh, we've done well enough. Um, and yet these are not, and it's not just about this government uh, functioning under this government. Whether the achievements have helped national interest in the whole, they've been executed successfully uh, several times. So uh, what do we get to tell our story um, in the mainstream without the romanticization that Bollywood provides with one of the romantics? No, I, I, I think uh, we're getting there. Uh -huh. I can see some, some uh, a friend of mine told me the other day that you must go and watch this if you forget the name of a serial that's been shown on Netflix or, or um, Amazon uh, about uh, the intelligence work in India, and it's he said it's pretty good. So we are learning the trade. Oh. We are learning how to do it. We're learning to be a, a you know, to have our voice heard and not be just okay. receptive of uh, opinion from abroad. They will tell us how good or bad we are. We will determine that ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it takes a certain amount of self-confidence in a population to be able to do that, right? To determine it ourselves. We don't have that. If we speak with a common person educated in English, which is a large population that goes abroad and then functions as representatives to be mostly exploited in their narrative uh, capture, right? Um, uh, very often they will find them very inferior, uh, feeling very inferior about um, their culture, about our our way of life, about our religion. Uh, they may to feel very, um, and it, it, they tend to internalize those ideas. How do we prevent that in the common man? It's 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 a you know you can't regiment people like this. That okay, you're now going to say only this okay. when you go abroad. That. You know, if, if, if the local chap tells you this, you go to say this. It has to come from within, but you know, must have your own confidence that, you know, I'm, I'm just as good as the next guy. If, if 25 of my nationals can be CEOs in some of your top companies, there must be something good we are doing. Right. You know, so, so, so we, and if my religion can survive, all the onslaughts, all these hundreds of years, there must be good in, something good in that. Mm -hmm. We are the only continuing unbroken civilization. Mm -hmm. The Greeks have gone, the Romans have gone, the Egyptians have gone, the Mesopotamian has gone. There is no Inca, no Peruvian, no nothing. It just us. So let's let's take pride in that. Not be apologetic about that. I have, I have my way of worshiping. I don't interfere in yours. I don't mm. insist that you follow mine. And so don't ask me to follow yours, and I'll behave myself. That's it. That's what right. most Indians do. Absolutely, absolutely. But then yeah. they call white right chastened, right? <laughs> that they're the oppressors and the yeah. castes no, they, are to. They, they, the they, they, I think it the the. Uh, Indian attitude of, of let it be doesn't mm. matter. Yeah, yeah, makes it easier. Makes us easier targets. Yeah, so. If you go to stand, you know, you have in some other religions. If you make a comment, they're up in arms the whole day. Look at mm. what happened to uh, that uh, that uh, story in the newspapers, uh, the French newspaper. Every time I forget that and name. Charlie Hebdo. Charlie Hebdo. The 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 and the cartoons issues how how people react so the majority say okay let it be let them be but that's not the way to do it that's not the way to do it I've come to make a living I've come to improve my life and I'm improving yours also they're getting better because of me my my kind. I mean, where would uh, the, uh, the Silicon Valley be without so many people from Andhra and Tamil Nadu and 
wherever they come. So that's uh, on one level they say yes, you're good, but when it comes to um, uh, giving out the goodies, then then suddenly it becomes uh, all mm. even mm. by numbers, and, and each each politician counts his votes first. Counts wants to have an impression first. Wants to have his re-election. So these are all interrelated human issues. And, so for uh, how Perhaps it requires us to band together as communities instead of pursuing individual goals and then leave our egos aside to kind of understand where our well-being lies. Because right now, racist, racist attacks, attacks on temples, they're very commonplace outside now. So uh, students getting killed even randomly, whether in shootings or uh, other incidents, even natural inc um, accidents, they do not get the kind of... Um, um, attention that one should, as somebody who is supposed to protect a citizen from a friendly nation, uh, they don't get the attention uh, they deserve for the simple reason being that they're Indian. And so, um, you know, perhaps it requires Indian uh, the diaspora to band together and have a few specific goals in mind that we need to protect our own, we need to protect our temples, we need to capture some of the narrative space, we shouldn't let people speak this way about us. And one of the things I would urge viewers to do is just go back to when uh, uh, Mr. Sood just commented on what we should, how we should be responding. And just remember that by heart, because that's, that's a very um, simple and concise way to tell our story that's that's a it's just you know let us be it's not defensive it's it's a it's a very um it's a great way to tell our story i think so that thank you for yes. that um, um all right um so moving on to the 0.5 war so we often say that you know we're in a 2.5 war it's no longer a two front war it's a 2.5 war and you've written about the 0.5 so um, on this front, is it alarmist to think that it is indeed war? Actually, you you know, uh, the world over, the, the, the concept of war is changing. Mm. There is still, uh, for the other world, or the third world, or whatever you might call it, Ukraine, for instance, it's it's America that wants to fight the war. It, I'm giving a brutal summary. They want to fight the war and finish Russia, and they're using Ukraine. And Ukraine is being, Ukrainians will die. Hmm. No American will die. Absolutely. No German will die. No Frenchman will die. No British will die. So they are fighting that war, but. On the other level, it is the war of narratives, the war of uh, the information warfare, fought on all media, all social media, every possible means are being used to create an impression that the Russians are losing. Mm -hmm. the, the only people who are actually believing this, this storyline is the creator of the storyline. The Russians have their own stories, and they believe their story. Uh, on India, Pakistan, we have Pakistan stories, and we have our. The Chinese have their stories to tell. Sometimes we tell tiny stories. Our main problem, our main problem in telling stories is, can you name six stations, six world capitals, where? All four of our newspapers, major four newspapers, have representatives, or the equivalent of CBS or CNN or BBC. Do we have them? If you don't have them, what is our voice? Absolutely. The voice is not there. Hmm. What did you see in the newspapers? How was how has the Ukraine war been reported? It has been reported by news reports from Reuters, CBS, oh. CNN, oh. 
happy, etc., etc. Nothing else, virtually. So we are getting one-sided pictures. We don't know exactly how the Russians. I'm not siding for my A or B, but I want to know both sides. Absolutely. And I don't get both sides. And then we are told that you are banning free speech. You banned it yourself. Yeah. You effectively yeah. Done without saying so. So uh, the we have to play, play the game. Well. Sorry. They banned Russian cats. Like you had a portion when you mentioned Liberty Fries and Liberty yeah, Cabbage. Yeah. And it is so similar that he, your history does not rhyme. It literally repeats. We've yeah. had banning of Russian models, Russian sports people, Russian cats breeds yeah. that are Russian. Uh, Russian cat breeds have been banned. There's, yeah. It's impressive how the world just goes on and uh, the news is out there, but no one's willing to listen to it because that yeah. mental block has been created through the reinforcement. And the funny thing is, it's so reductive, the kind of narration that is going on in a lot of these echo chambers is uh, we stand for the little guy i was in uh, scotland and england recently and entire music festivals entire events parties pubs everybody's talking about the war from a reactive angle of we stand with the little guy yeah. we're a small nation so we understand how it is to be little now England, especially as a small nation, was the ruler of much of the world at one point. Yes. And yet, yeah, these are the narratives that people simply forget the past and believe in this. So perhaps mm. we also require some amount of reductive retelling of stories. Yeah, that's that's. We have to tell our own stories, and we have to we have to say that we are bigger, we are better than you, we are better than you, we are bigger than you, yeah. and we are. Yeah. yeah. We are we are a bigger economy. We have a larger uh, population. We have uh, more more. The, our armies are bigger than two members of the P five. No, we're not there. Um, our economy is bigger than theirs, but we're not there. Yes. So, so this kind of a thing will go on, and you know, I was told by one. Uh, British. Oh, we are very sporting. We always support the underdog. Mm, mm, mm. Yes. Yeah, so long as you're winning, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't talk to me. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Large chunks of information disappear. So it's not merely about setting out a story. It's about ensuring that the other side never shows up unless it's convenient. So now we see a few leakages of, you know, perhaps there's Ukrainian corruption, perhaps um, we were wrong, you know, the vaccines did not work as intended. So we see a little bit of a leakage now that it's more convenient. However, the narrative setting depended greatly on actual um, um, banning in a way of uh, cancelling a lot of the news that was coming in. We've hardly seen, we've not seen any of their attack, of the Ukrainian attacks on Roma people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, by official forces. We've not seen their mutilation of uh, bodies with the hack and curse, the hooked cross, uh, because mm -hmm. they follow new Nazism. So uh, there's so much uh, that is just it's available, but you have to go looking for it. So a lot of the mainstream news is essentially dependent on stopping the other side. Now, as yeah. a democracy, we can't afford that. Mm -hmm. So how do we build the reinforcement? I mean, of course, the US should also be part of this, you know, we're a democracy, we can't be doing that, but they did. Uh, we're not that kind of nation, I believe that's never going to happen in India. But how do we tell our stories more effectively? Well, I think you can only tell your story if you have the means of communication. Oh, nice. You need to build we, that. Though. You know, we are still dependent on Google and uh, we are still dependent on uh, Twitter. We are still dependent on everything that is Western. And uh, I'm sure so many of our opinions on Twitter and all or Facebook are not allowed to be publicized. Yeah. 
So it's 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 a it's a very long, very hard game. It's not easy to say that I can tell my story to them. But like I said, you have to make it such that he wants to hear that story. Mm-hmm. He wants to make it acceptable. You have to make it acceptable to him first. What you're saying, it sounds good to him, and then you then you hit him. Yeah. Gradually, with a slight variation of the theme, slight variation of the story, then it becomes acceptable. It's not going to be happening tomorrow. It's not going to. Be, it's going to take quite a while. But, but, if we become economically strong and internally cohesive, they will all come. How do we become internally cohesive? That's the part. Well, that, that is that is a challenge we Indians have ourselves, because we, and that has been actually a problem, right from the start. Yeah, yeah. I do down my neighbor. I'll take somebody else's help. And uh, that's that's how they were able to conquer. Mm. I mean, a lot of them fought very bravely. It's not as if they came immediately after uh, the prophet died and we had Muslim invasions. Immediately, it yeah. took a long, it took yeah. a long, long time. Five hundred years before they actually established themselves. Right. So uh, we we did do that. We uh, I do believe that. Uh, Alexander was defeated and he left. Yeah, but yeah. you cannot say that the Greek civilization lost to this Hindu civilization. No, of course not. Storyline had to be that the Greeks won. Oh, that's right. Okay, <laughs> like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. That was the storyline right yeah. from the start. Why haven't they ever talked about uh, our uh, all the uh, magnificent? Uh, Ports and temples of South India or East India. We we were never talked about. We were never told about them. There was nothing in my history book. In fact, we didn't have history as a subject at school. Okay, that's the first. We, I haven't heard of this. We had geography, which had a part of history in it. I see. I see. History was not my subject. I had no knowledge of history except what I read on my own. Mm-hmm. So internal cohesion is well, built with narrative I, set I in school, really because we started our school. I I belong to that era. We mean, when we were in our independence only two or three years old when I started school. So um, there was no Indian history to be taught. I mean, Majumdar wasn't allowed to be taught. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. So we had very little uh, Indian history. Mm-hmm. And only mm-hmm. later you started ferreting around and trying to find out, and then you, you, now you come to a state that you find there is so much, so much uh, knowledge, and I'm so glad there are so many youngsters who are writing about it. Yeah, yeah. writing good books, readable books, and I have a whole lot of them that I care. And I think that is where your narratives get built, mm-hmm. bit by bit. Um. Still, do you not think that, at least in this space, I believe that the government has a role to play when it comes to um, setting the education books right? For example, you mentioned Alexander, the same thing with Akbar and Maharana Pratap. Now we have history with proofs where it, Akbar himself has written about it, his hagiographers have written about uh, Maharana Pratap winning, and uh, mm-hmm. there's so much primary evidence about it. And yet, it's there in the history books as him having lost and having run off. And then yeah. same thing with the Aryan invasion theory, which is no scientific legs to stand on, which has been discarded by every major university outside. Um, it's been introduced to some academicians, academics bickering amongst each other about, oh, now it's not archaeology, it's genetics, all of those things. Yet it's taught to our children to, you know, in schools. So this is one aspect where the government is sorely lacking. We we overplay something like Sati, where the world was burning witches at stake, and here yes. there was 
some few incidents and yet these are the tropes that indians internalize growing up feeling lost and you know feeling weak when it comes to these narratives so here you know isn't it the government that takes charge do i think governments have to set the uh, the storyline as it were mm. and then leave it to the others to follow that the moment you start writing doing it yourself then it becomes bureaucratic and you you know you don't want to say this you don't want to say that you get so and so will get hurt about it so let's play it safe mm mm-hmm. we have to co- i th- i think patriotism or nationalism is not the sole birthright of the bureaucrat everybody given a chance would would help would cooperate you've got to motivate them come here a b and c you sit down and give me a story of india yes and in 40 to 47 or 48 what happened tell it without fear merely uh, you know changing the story is not enough is you have to tell the, as it happened as it really happened mm-hmm. because if you if you're only going to say it is wrong or if everything uh, the previous party did was wrong that's not how it was I mean, you you build on bases you build on uh, stories you correct them maybe but you follow a particular line so you have to keep that in mind that people have to be co-opted as a is it it's a it's a, nat- it's a national uh, venture we we are taking that we are going to discover our past and we are going to write it down without malice to the to the man of today or the woman of today there is there is absolutely that was life then but let's not forget that was the life then yes i mean do you think the europeans didn't have that kind of it's a, they've been fighting all the time mm mm-hmm. they are the ones who gave us two world wars yes because they couldn't get along with each other mm. essentially cut down to the basic that's how it was yeah they now they probably give us a third one yeah but we have to therefore remember that what happened in the past happened but it did happen mm-hmm. but i'm not going to blame the the person today for what happened 500 years ago right I'm also oh. to blame. I let it happen then. Yeah, yeah, true. So I want to know my past as it was, and I want to know my present as it is, and I want to know what my future shall be. What is the future I'm leaving behind for the kids, for my mm-hmm. grandkids, or after that? And we can't unless you are honest about what happened. True. Yeah. Yep. there were mistakes there were excesses mm. and uh, not not as if everything was uh, all lovely and beautiful no there were happiness comes in patches it doesn't come in one regular 60 year flow right. or 80 year it comes and goes so similarly in life you got to take accept Yeah, we made mistakes. There was somebody who was treacherous. There was somebody who was faithless. Yeah. And uh, but uh, that's it. I've got it down. I know that mistake. I won't let it happen again. Well, um, I think uh, those uh, some of what you say in small one-liners are extremely profound. I hope the viewers, you know, <laughs> internalize what you're saying and. really uh, just go back and watch this video a couple of times to uh to imbibe what uh, he, Mr. Sudha is actually saying uh but um before i let you go i have um two questions uh a little on the personal side one is what made you uh choose to become a spy 
uh, head of fire organization eventually <laughs> well, what pushed you there and two what pushed you to write books when you weren't doing this anymore uh good questions i joined you know i, I joined the postal service and i began my career in 66 and then uh, a couple of years later people started saying oh there's a new organization that's come into being um, it's, it's very good. It's, it's, it's going to be an elitist kind of a thing. And, you know, civil servants like this kind of a thing. So, I started ferreting around, but couldn't find anything much. And then, one day I got a message from my headquarters um, saying, you, you're, uh, you're needed, you please go and meet so-and-so at so-and-so place uh, for an interview. So I went, I met those people, there was only one person. And um, that's it. I, I mean, I, they asked me a few questions, they sort of looked at me up, he looked at me up and down, and, and that was it. And then I went back to where I was, and a couple of months later I was asked to join. They had actually taken out our dossiers and had a look at it and said, this guy seems okay. So I joined the RAW in 72. And then I had no idea that I would end up where I did. That's life. And then and when I, how I started writing my books, I don't know, I, I actually started First, writing for newspapers. Every fortnight, I used to write for the Hindustan Times for some time, then others, and so on and so forth. Then the essays, and then so chapters of books. Then somebody says, Why don't you do a book? So that's how uh, Penguin and I got to the first book. Yeah. And, uh, it evolved from there because I, I the the first thing they wanted me to write was on intelligence on RW. I said I won't write. I'm not going to write, you know. But as a concept or intelligence, as a trade, yeah, I can do that, and I, that's what I did. And and this writing of narratives and explaining how it works is has been a bugbear for a long time. So I wanted to do that. I smuggled in a chapter in my, right. my first book. And then I said, now I must, this is a, the second book is a spin-off of the first one. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be another one after this. So let's oh, see. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. It's a, honestly a book that I genuinely enjoyed. It's not written from, um, I don't know, a narrow perspective, I believe. So it gives a very broad picture and again, pulls no punches, which is impressive. It's not trying to appease to anybody. So um, um, audiences, again, please, please to get uh, the books and uh, you can, um, I'll, I'll link the purchase link below in the description box as well. All right, uh, Mr. Sooth, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I wish you good health and good luck. Thank you. And look Thank forward you. to your book so much. Thank you. Hope, hope it's, it's worth it. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. All the best. Thank you.